Now, turn with me tonight in your Bible to um, 1 Timothy. We were in 2 Timothy this morning. So we're turning to 1 Timothy tonight. And I want to read 1 Timothy chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 9. Maybe we should read verse 8. Just to help to give maybe a better sense. Paul is dealing here with the subject of prayer. 1 Timothy chapter 2 now. I'm going to read from verse 8. First Timothy 2 verse 8. Reading of course from the authorized verse. I will therefore that men pray everywhere. Lifting up holy hands. Without wrath and doubting. In like manner also. Now maybe I could just pause there. In like manner also I believe is a reference to woman praying. I, I believe that women ought to and should pray openly and publicly in the house of God. Verse 9 again. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, Vigilant, sober, of good behaviour, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Amen. We know that God will stamp with his own approval and blessing this reading of the Holy Scripture. Now my text tonight is taken from 1 Timothy chapter 2 and the verse 12. It reads, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. And my subject tonight is entitled, The Bible Says No to Woman Bishops in the Church. Last month on the 26th of June, the Church of England consecrated its first female bishop during what was described by one commentator as an historic ceremony in York Minster. Now I'm conscious that the commentator has described it as historically significant. I want to declare in my eyes and in the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ and I'll prove that to you in a moment the head of the church, in his eyes, it's not historically significant. In fact, it's horribly <laughs> sinful. The Reverend Libby Lane, uh, vicar of St. Peter of Hale and St. Elizabeth of Ashley in the Diocese of Chester since 2007, became the Bishop of Stockport in front of a thousand people. <coughs> Despite the fact, of course, that women were ordained to the 
priesthood, as the Church of England call it, or the ranks of the clergy for us in Northern Ireland, as far back as 1994, uh, to date, up until the 26th of January 2015, no woman had been able to take on the church's most or much senior roles. However, all this was to change. In November 2014, the church formally adopted legislation to change canon law to allow what they call women priests to become women bishops. And advocates of the change, of course, used and propagated the very same arguments that were used to push for women's ordination to the ministry in the first place. Gender discrimination was one of them. Another argument was those of Reformation teaching need to move with the times and become up to date in the 21st century. Another argument was that 30 to 50 percent of local congregations are women and that women could do a good job. And it's therefore plausible, it's therefore reasonable since the ordination of women into the priesthood that they should be ordained into becoming bishops. The Archbishop of York, uh, John Centineau, he said, and I quote, It's high time we had women bishops. This is something I have been praying for and working toward for years. Archbishop Justin Welby, I quote, It's a new way of being a church and moving forward together. Now the question for us tonight is this. Is it immensely historic? Or is it horrifying iniquitous? Is it really significant? Or really sinful and sad in the church's departure from the word of God? See, we need to discover in our day what the Bible says. We need to do what our Radio broadcasts tell us, let the Bible speak. Now, thankfully, and I want to say thankfully, and I put it on record, uh, that there are some evangelicals in the Church of England who bitterly oppose the ordination of women to the priesthood and who bitterly oppose the ordination of women to the bishopric. The televised service was briefly interrupted. The Archbishop of York, John Centineau, asked the church if Mrs. Lane should be ordained a bishop. And the moment he asked the church that question, the Reverend Paul Williamson, he stepped forward shouting, Not in the Bible! Not in the Bible! And I remember watching that. It was on the news again. And I thought, well, that's the crux of the whole matter. Not in the Bible. And later when a spokesman was questioned by the BBC over the short protest, he stated that the Reverend Paul Williamson had a right to protest, but added that he was a lone voice. One voice, he said, in a sea of voices affirming. You see, there is today in the Church of England those who are delighted over the development despite the fact that there's not one word of scriptural uh, authority for such an ordination to take place, despite the fact that it goes against the uh, 39 articles of the Church of England, they don't care. They're delighted with such a development. Thankfully, as I've said, there's those on the other side of the fence who are dismayed. And we we thank God for the dismay among evangelicals, those who traditionally hold to the truth of the gospel. There are also dismay among certain Anglo-Catholics who are striving with union uh, with the Church of Rome and see this as a plank uh, against furthering the cause of unity. I, I quote some of those traditional evangelicals. And this is what was said on the 26th of January Today we are not just being asked to push the walls further apart. We're being asked to push down the walls that hold the house together. 
And I have no doubt that many evangelicals will threaten to leave their local parish. Some already have, and some will continue to do so. And I have no doubt that it will put a further obstacle on the unity uh, with the Anglo-Catholics and the Church of Rome, even to this day. But one fundamental question remains, and it's this. What is the verdict of the Bible? Or, or what saith the Scriptures? Now, I'm going to show you three things tonight. Remember the theme now. The Bible says no to woman bishops in the church. Here's the first thing I would say. There are no contradictions in the Bible. The Bible does not and cannot contradict itself. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The Bible, we believe, and we have a high view of the scriptures, is infallible. The Bible is an errand. The Bible, God's word, is forever settled in heaven. There's no errors or mistakes in the scriptures. Let the Bible speak. Look at verse 12. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man to be in silence. For, and we'll come to those reasons before we finish, but let's just establish the fact. Here's a verse in the Bible, and it tells us that... Um, a woman is not to teach nor deserve authority over the man, but to be in silence. Come down to First Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This is a true saying. If a man desireth the office of a bishop, he desireth a, a, a good work. Um, it, it says here in verse 2, a bishop then must be the husband of one wife. Now, now, here's verses that are clear. There's no contradiction here. Let the Bible speak. T turn over there to uh, Revelation chapter 2. In Revelation chapter 2, we have got one of the letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And Revelation chapter 2, uh, verse 18 right through to 29 uh, deals with the letter to the church at Thyatira. This is the longest letter. This is a central letter. There's 12 verses. And uh, if I could just open it up a little bit, um, the, 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 the letter starts with Jesus, the head of the church. Look at verse 18. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, uh, the word angel is angelos, which means the messenger or, or, or the minister. It's not talking about a winged creature. It's talking about a real, true human being. Uh, and unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God. Now isn't that clear? Who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works. You see, it starts with Jesus Christ. The Son of God, the head of the church. And he has got eyes like uh, flames of fire. And those eyes tonight are, are piercing into the heart and mind of every person. And like Hagar, we have to be brought to the place where we say, Thou God seest me. And if you're unsaved, God sees you. And you can try to hide your ways from the Lord. You can try to hide your sin from the Lord. But the Lord sees it all. Uh, there's nothing hid from his gaze. Every word, all our ways, all our wickedness, he knows 24-7. Why? Because his eyes are like flames of fire. Uh, and even if our hearts are cold and careless and we're in a backslidden state, uh, he knows all about it. And then it adds the words, and his feet are like fine brass. Now brass in the Bible speaks of judgment. There's coming a day of judgment for the church. There's coming a day when his righteous judgment will be meted out. And of course he's already 
tasted that judgment for his people when his feet were nailed to Calvary's tree and he bears the marks on his hands and his feet. And I could just ask the question, are you saved? Are you trusting in him? Who or what are you clinging to for salvation? Now, not only think of Jesus in the church, but, but look with me at verse 20 now. And this is where I want to get to. And I'm conscious of time. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to just my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now, I, I, I'm going to, to, to stick my neck out here. I, I believe that this Jezebel is a real woman in the church at Thyatira who's lording it over God's flock. And she's in a position of power and authority. And she's there in that position. And she's leading God's people into sin. And into silliness. And I believe tonight. That no church should have a woman minister. And I believe this is a rebuke to every church that has a woman minister. Or a woman elder. Because that church is on a collision course with Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who has eyes like flames of fire and feet like brass. I heard recently, I wasn't speaking to this minister, but I heard this minister, uh, I believe he's an independent Methodist, and he was at a minister's conference and they were having a a discussion. And they had come across some minister, um, I'm not saying it was in Northern Ireland, it might have been in America. And the minister from his pulpit was teaching it. You can be a Christian and enter into and engage a life of sin if you like. We need to have an open mind. We need to broaden our horizons. You need to have a wider perspective. And of course, that was just the spirit of Jezebel. Because it says here... um, Nevertheless, I've somewhat against thee. What has he got? Uh, Because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. She was telling them it's okay to sin. It's okay to do this. You see, the Church of England knows what the Bible teaches. But here's their argument. It's a very ancient book. And it's written out of the beliefs of its time. And of course, women should be priests and bishops in the church. But I want to state tonight that the Bible is not culturally conditioned. You see, the minute you say the Bible is culturally conditioned, then it becomes out of date. It becomes irrelevant to our culture, to our time frame. And I want to state tonight as a minister of the gospel, the Bible is not out of date. The Bible is not culturally conditioned. The Bible is not contradictory. The Bible is God's wisdom personified. We we read this morning, um, although we didn't touch on it, Paul was writing to Timothy and he told him in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman, that he did not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly cutting the, the, the word of truth. And remember again the apostle Paul says in in 2 Corinthians and in chapter 4, he, 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 or chapter 2 rather in verse 17, he says, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. You see, we seek the guidance and the help of God's Holy Spirit. And we're not out to change the word of God. And we're not out to corrupt the word of God. And we're simply out to saying, let the Bible speak. And what I'm saying tonight is there's no contradictions in the Bible. And you've got to let it speak plainly to your heart. Here it is. Paul says, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. And we've got it here. If a man desireth the office of a bishop, He desireth a good work. 
Now, notice secondly, and maybe this will be the heart of our message. You see, there are numerous considerations in the Bible. Now, they put that down as a principle. There's no contradictions in the Bible. And here's another one. There are numerous considerations in the Bible. Let, let me just give you three. All people are equal before God. Especially in the matter of salvation. Doesn't the Bible say in Romans 3 and 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And when did we sin? We sinned in Adam. We fell in him. We inherited the guilt of his first transgression. And we became guilty sinners. We had broken God's law. We, we inherited from him a polluted nature. We have a love for sin. Men and women, boys and girls, we're all in a common platform and position. We're all sinners in the sight of God. We're all children of wrath by nature and practice. And we all need God's salvation. And we could talk tonight about the reality of salvation. Well, why do we need to be saved? Because we are sinners. And oh, that we could grasp that simple truth. And oh, that we could understand that. And I want you to understand that Paul went on to say, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. You see, we could talk tonight about the recipients of salvation. We could talk tonight about salvation being purchased uh, by the, the personal work of Jesus Christ, uh, the shedding of his precious blood. We could talk tonight about salvation offered in the gospel. We could talk about salvation being received by faith. Um, and that's what believing in Jesus uh, really means doesn't matter if a man's religious, doesn't matter if a man or woman attends church, doesn't matter if they can claim to being baptized or, or, or catechized or communicated. The, the chief question is, what think ye of Christ? Is he your Lord and Savior? Are you in Christ? Was there a time when you realized you were a lost sinner and you needed to be saved and Christ is the only Savior of sinners and you went to Christ? You see, if we, if we think of the church tonight, um, all people are, are, are on an equal platform. We are sinners saved by the grace of God. Therefore, we are one in Christ Jesus. The question of questions is, have you come to Jesus Christ? Is he your Lord and Savior? Have you received a full and free and forever justification? Do you know the, the fullness of fellowship in God's family? So, so there's the first consideration. There's numerous considerations to think about. Here's a second one. Women have a part to play in the work of spreading the gospel. That's indicated and implied in the Old Testament. It's indicated and implied in the New Testament. Let me demonstrate. And I'm not turning to these references. I'll just give them to you. You can get them off me if you want. Exodus 15 and 20, for example, talks about Miriam, the sister of Moses. Remember the victory over the Egyptians and Pharaoh at the Red Sea? And she's described there as a prophetess. She's given a prominent role. And she leads the singing, the song of victory unto the Lord. She was not stopped or rebuked by uh, Moses or Aaron. Another um, inference that's indicated in the Old Testament, think of Deborah, an Old Testament judge, one who sought the advice and counsel of the Lord, Judges 4 and 4. In 2 Kings 22, verse 14, we've got a very powerful illustration. A, a woman by the name of Huldah, H-U-L-D-I-H, the wife of Shalom. Uh, certain men came to her, some of them were priests. And uh, she said in 2 Kings 22, and verse 15, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, tell the man that sent you. And of course she went on to give advice to the king. And she was advising the king that judgment was coming. Go back and tell him. She was warning of judgment to come. 
And she gave wise counsel to the king how to avoid the judgment, to, to repent and return to the Lord with all his heart. Now we could add to that Joel 2.28 uh, where it talks about um, the, the young woman uh, prophesying uh, and uh, the young men dreaming dreams, of course, a, a quotation that was spoken about uh, on the day of Pentecost. Uh, and uh, there we read in um, Acts uh, uh, chapter 2, it says in verse 16, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I'll pour out in those days of my spirit. And they shall prophesy. Now turn to one further reference. Uh, turn tonight to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now we're just thinking about considerations in the Bible. Women have a part to play in the work of spreading the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Sorry, I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 14. First Corinthians 14. And it says, but of all prophesy, verse 24, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God, and report that God is in you of a truth. In the 1 Corinthians 11, or sorry, 1 Corinthians 14, um, that Paul is mentioning there in these verses of women praying and uh, prophesying in public. And the prophecy was to edify and comfort um, God's people. So if you take these references that we've already given, you would have to say from at least a, a, an honest conclusion that it would be impossible to deny that God has used women to preach and testify of his goodness, his grace, and even the gospel. And we think today of women serving the Lord in the church. We think of women serving in the role of uh, Sunday school, children's work. We think of the role of women serving the Lord in the mission fields of the world, maybe in some respect taking the place of men. Men are marked by their absence and their women are there. We think of our sister Margaret Russell and others who are being used by God to fulfill a role in the work and witness of God's church. And to deny that women have no part in the life of the church and its work and witness is to fly in the face of the facts of Scripture. And it would be a despite to the reality of the church as it exists, it would be doing despite to the reality of church history because God has seen fit to bless women in the work of his church. Women have a part to play in the work of spreading the gospel. And that, that, that's a consideration. So we put that down. There's the second consideration. <coughs> now thirdly, the Bible draws a line beyond which even the woman can't go. Now, we're studying the Bible tonight. The Bible, as we've said, it's not an ancient book. It doesn't contradict itself. It's not culturally conditioned. It's applicable to all our lives at all times. It's living, it's fresh, it's up to date. Now, now let me just turn to two passages of Scripture and then we'll be through. Uh, turn over there to uh, 1 Corinthians 14. Um, it's verse uh, 34. 1 Corinthians 14, 34. Let the woman keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. Now, now there's a verse you should underline. The inference here is that women were attempting to speak. Now let me give you the context because it's very important. Let's remember, never build a doctrine on a verse. Always examine the context. 
Always try to understand the theme, the, the, the wider theme of the chapter or the book. The theme of um, 1 Corinthians 14 is about speaking in tongues. And uh, people could supernaturally speak a foreign language, a language that the apostles and others hadn't learned. It was a gift of the Holy Spirit. I believe it was a real language. Uh, and it was a sign to unbelievers in the church as they heard the gospel. Let's think of Corinth being a port city. Uh, and um, the, 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 the thought was that if, if there was no interpreter to, to interpret the message, uh, then the women, uh, they were not to attempt uh, to, to get up uh, and interpret this message. For example, if a Chinese man come into the church at Corinth and he could only speak Chinese and couldn't speak Greek and the message was being preached in Greek and somebody spoke a message in tongues uh, of the gospel in the Chinese language and then someone interpreted that in the Chinese language, that man could hear the truth of the gospel and he would know that God's amongst them. And that was the import uh, of those verses that we read earlier uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 14. It says in verse 28, But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Uh, and here's the core of Paul's commands. No woman should exercise this gift in public. Uh, and I'm convinced that is the context. The gift of tongues, I believe, has long since uh, been withdrawn by the Lord from his church, uh, given that we have got the fullness of revelation of the Holy Scriptures. Uh, our missionaries, when they go to a mission field, have to learn a language. I'm not saying, of course, that God couldn't still give the gift if that was his mind. But the gift in Corinth, when it was in operation, no woman was, ex to, was permitted to exercise this gift in public. And that's the context of the command to keep silence in the churches. Now, he, he, here's this other reference, and our time is gone, so we need to be quick. Turn back there to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Now, now the theme of these verses is not speaking in tongues, but the theme of these verses is authority. Verse 12, But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Here's a reference to the highest teaching office in the church, the office of the elder, the office of the bishop. They're used interchangeably in the Bible. One in the Greek is, is presbyteros, and the other is episkopos. And there's a reference to the ministers of the church, to the ruling elder, to the teaching elder. And only in these offices can, 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 can a man be ordained. And this was a line drawn by God. And, and if you think about it tonight, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ, when he lived in the first century, chose 12 men to be apostles. Why not choose a woman? Were there no suitable candidates? There was. Think of Mary Magdalene. There was other godly women. And they had a high level of spirituality. We could say they were well qualified. We would say they loved the Lord just as much as the men loved the Lord. Uh, and we could have made the argument, but that would have been a good magnet for other women to be attracted to the Lord. Uh, what about the whole question of equality gender? Were those not factors in the first century like today? Yes, they were. But the Lord only chose men to be apostles. The Lord did choose Mary Magdalene to first announce the resurrection message. She served the risen Lord in that capacity. I have no problem with that. That's what the Bible teaches. But, but why can't a woman be an elder? Why can't she be ordained into the ministry? Why can't she be a bishop? Now just bear with me. Look at verse 13 of 1 Timothy chapter 2. Look at your Bible now. For it means because... Adam was first formed, then Eve. Now here's a reference to the book of beginnings. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. The Bible is not culturally conditioned. Paul took Timothy back 4,000 years. Uh, Timothy, it's because of what happened at creation. The woman was created out of man. 
And she was created out of man for the man, to complement the man, to complete the man. The man was not created for the woman. She has a, a, a different station in life. There, there's an emphasis here to, 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 to do with headship. But the head of every man is Christ. And the head of every woman is the man. And the head of Christ, of course, is God. And also another reason was because of what happened at the fall. It says, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. You see, it's a question of authority. The man who was made the head of the woman is responsible for making all the right decisions. And, and, and there's a partnership of relationship. There's a mutual desire of love and respect and affection. Doesn't the Bible talk about the husband of one wife? Not the wife of one husband. And therefore it's a question of authority. Man occupies that position because that's what God has decreed. And there's no sanction in the Bible. For a woman to hold the office. And that one of the reasons given. She's easily deceived just like Eve was. She can do her own thing and go her own way. She can have her own plans and ambitions. But it can't be contrary to God's mind. And if it is. Then we've got to accept. Well there's a line that even they cannot cross over. So here's the numerous considerations in the Bible. And the Church of England, I believe, have completely set these to the one side. One final thing. Here's a third reason. There are numerous condemnations in the Bible. Let me just finish with this thought. In Isaiah 8 and 20, it says to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And you know, whenever the Reverend Paul Williamson stepped forward and shouted out, not in the Bible, he was absolutely right. Because the Church of England was doing something that was contrary to the Scriptures. To the law, to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And we'd finish the way we started. Remember the church in Thyatira? <coughs> Jezebel was there as a prophetess. In the church, seducing God's people. And what did the Son of God, who has eyes like flames of fire and feet of brass, say to that church? Nevertheless, I've somewhat against thee. You see, the Lord Jesus is against it. And when Paul says, I suffer not a woman to teach you deserve authority of the man, he knew that the Lord Jesus was against it. And he knew that no good would come from it. He knew that what would follow is certain condemnation. And if you read, and we haven't time tonight, some occasion we'll maybe preach on it from a different angle. Read the church in Thyatira, Revelation 2, 18 to 29. Not only have you got Jesus there and Jezebel, but you've got judgment. And it was all because of what was happening in the life of the church. And I think it's only a further sign. Of judgment. The Lord's judgment. Against the church that once stood firm. For the great glorious truths of the gospel of Christ. It is a warning to ourselves. Not to depart. From the plain and clear teaching of the scriptures. The Bible says no. To woman bishops in the church. Take these thoughts to mind. There's no contradictions in the Bible.
Take these considerations to heart. Take this condemnation of Jezebel in the church to heart. 